Hello and welcome to another episode about Bevy. So in this episode, I'm going to be talking about how you can use the unofficial Bevy editor, please, and how to create editor windows to allow you to have custom behavior and modification in your game while you're developing it. The primary reason I'm making this video now and not like ages ago when Bevy Editor Please first came out is that Bevy 0.10 just came out and there is no hint of editor in it. So I feel like this is a good time to show off this community made plugin that we can use as something to tide us over until 0.11, which promises to have some kind of editor functionality. So at the moment, I'm currently loaded into my hexagon game that if you've been watching my channel, I just did a devlog explaining how this is still generated. Don't mind the broken meshes. When you add the editor plugin to your application, which is just to include the editor and add the plugin, this will give you this functionality. So you can press E and it'll bring up a Unity style editor, which has all the entities on the left in a hierarchy then a camera in the middle that can be swapped into multiple different types of camera, uh, pan orbit and like a 2D one as well. And then you can also enable UI if you have any so that you'll be able to see it in the editor. Otherwise, by default, the editor cameras don't pick up UI. Uh, down at the bottom, you can see all the inspectable resources in your game. So if you have a resource that you need to just tweak values on, I believe anything that implements reflect will appear down here. You can also see like your assets, so images, color materials, and it just sort of gives you a way of knowing what's loaded. So if you're having performance issues or memory issues, you could go in here and see that like you have hundreds of materials, different materials loaded. And if your game is small enough, you may go, oh, that's not supposed to be there. Uh, then you've got some debug settings, such as the ability to pause the time so if you have something that happens, like animations, that uses Bevy's built-in time resource, this will pause it. You can turn on wireframes, which looks hideous on this map, but shows all the wireframes of different meshes. Uh, you can highlight selected entity, which is if like if I come down here, it's probably not going to work. Uh, if I selected an entity, like a chunk, it will uh, highlight it on the world. You just over there. So as you select the different chunks, or as you select them in the hierarchy, it'll highlight them in the world. So primarily what this video is going to be showing off today is making custom windows. So these are all the windows you'll... So if you go up here, you can open up all the windows that is currently available from the inspector. You can also add custom windows here. So this is where I can put my map descriptor, which lets me change the noise settings I use to generate this map the seed and all that information. So if I you know, tweak the seed, uh, the rules I use in order to specify what cell each section should be after it generates. I then have a like a drop down that lets me generate what the rules look like. So if I tweak and say that mountains need slightly more high humidity, slightly, I guess slightly less humidity, we'll make, and it'll make this mountain range wider. If I say that they can have even higher humidity, it'll make it wider. So this is just, a representation of the rules that I've specified. Then you've got the noise texture here, which just generates the humidity map and the temperature map and a combined map. I can clear these away. And then I have a biome map that when I click draw will show me what the world should approximately look like when generated. And I've got it set. So if I press F5, it will regenerate the world. But because regenerating the world is very slow because it needs to do all the waveform collapse mathematics, Having the ability to quickly sample what a seed will give me is a good way to, you know, sort of test and be like, uh, what's this map going to look like? You know, and then what's this map going to look like? Obviously, this would be faster if it wasn't generating chunks because that saturates the cores. But for this video, I'm going to show you how I implemented that window so that you can go about implementing your own custom editor windows. So if I drop out of the game and into the code. So this is where my uh, map generation code is dealt with, which contains like all the uh, simplex noise and whatnot that I use to generate the map. I then have my rules here. And this is where the first step of adding inspectable stuff comes in is it has to derive reflect 
because that's how the inspector actually knows how to display everything is using reflect. All the versions of the inspector before the 1.10 release uh, required a special inspector trait. They could use reflect, but it had an inspector in trait on top. That's been removed for purely being reflect based. Then there is also the inspector options. This is what allows me to specify things like the minimum and maximum value that floats can be. And then I ignore certain values in reflect since they don't reflect themselves, such as this um, hex cell doesn't have a reflect implementation, neither does color or string. So these values are ignored in reflect so that they don't turn up in the inspector because it doesn't like not having reflectable things. Then when we pop over to the actual inspector window that I generate, the first thing I need is a placeholder struct that just contains all the logic for the specific window. I've also specified a debug image size, which is that uh, biome map that you saw, is so I can just tweak that and get the nice feeling size. So then we implement the editor window trait. This trait allows us to specify what state represents the information that we need in order to render our window correctly. And this is stored in its own sort of resource that is passed to all the editor windows. I believe this is performance reasons that it stores it, but there could be other reasons. Uh, you need to give the editor a, a name. This is the text that will appear in that open window button that you saw me click. Then the only trait of this method that we need to, well, of this trait that we need to implement is the UI trait. This gives us access to the world, the editor's context, and the UI. So with that, we can do everything we need to generate our image and interact with the world. So if we want to have a button do something like spawn an entity, we can do all that through our mutable world access. One thing to keep in mind is because we have mutable world access, there can only be one editor window doing its logic at a time which means that you lose all of Berry's parallel access if you do things through editor windows. This may be improved in the future, but currently you only have one editor running at a time, so single thread process, while the editors do their thing. So keep your expensive logic in Bevy's ECS, not in your editor window rendering code. So the first thing I do is take my map descriptor, which was that pole and noise generator that I showed before, and I take that out of the world in order to allow it to have mutable access all over the place. Since some of these functions require world access, and if they do that, then I can't have a borrowed reference to a resource. So I use resource scope, which takes the resource out of the world and lets me continue using the world without that resource. I don't know if I need to clone the context anymore. This was a bit of a holdover from the old version. But then I go into my uh, editor context and get my map gen window. And this will return the window state that I have specified. Otherwise I return because something's gone wrong. In all, most all cases, you should always get this, uh, this should always return because when you initialize the window, it initializes the state. Then I spawn a label, which just puts plain text that can't be interacted with. I indent the uh, UI, which just shifts everything over a little bit. Then I make a collapsible window, which there are a lot of well-named traits or components that you would use on your UI in order to get the functionality you'd expect. So collapse makes those little collapsible windows. We give it a bit of text that will be next to the collapsible window. And then we give it a function that it will run that has access to the UI. Then I do things like make a horizontal. This will keep all objects in a horizontal layout. I then label seed and provide bevy inspector from value. This is a helper function that will generate a UI for like a float and integer, like basic types that themselves don't have an inspectable window layout. So with the UI from value, I can pass it the seed by mutable reference, the UI that I want it to draw it for and access to the world. This is so that certain values like um, handles to images can extract the actual data of the image back out. 
and so will uh, display an actual representation of the image. It returns a boolean if the value changes. So if you edit this value, it will return true, which will then cause us to update our noise with the new value that was returned. So this allows us to have our noise descriptor use the state's value and only update when it changes. We then repeat this process for each of the potential values that you can edit for my noise generation. And then I have a collapsible set of rules. And then for that, we basically iterate through each rule, making its own collapsible section with the name and the index, or with rule and then the index. We then do some fancy if logic just to extract the color that should be next to the rule. And then we do some more logic, like setting some labels if it's in debug mode for allowing rules and colors to be set. And then we use this color picker, which allows us to give a mutable reference to a EGUI color, and it'll give us that fancy color wheel that you get in um, like Blender and all that that lets you pick what color you want the color to be. And then I just display the rule with its fancy uh, UI from value and pass it the rule, which then uses the description that we specified for it earlier to render that out to the screen. Then each of the images is just a collapsible box that has a button to draw the map, which has an unclicked method, which will return true when you click the button. I then use some pretty simple code to go through and generate the color maps. So I generate a new image with the size of the debug images, and then I set all the pixels to black, then iterate through each pixel, sampling the random noise and setting the appropriate value at that specific point. I do that for the uh, rules map. I actually sample and get what texture it would set. For the noise map, I do it for humidity, temperature, and then a combination of the two, which is just one fills the red channel, one fills the blue channel. Eventually, I'm intending to add a height map, but that's uh, irrelevant for this video. And then for the biome one, I do the same thing again, but I sample for each position, its humidity and temperature, and then sample the rules texture uh, to work out what color each of those cells should be in order to generate the appropriate map. I then just have a default function that allows me to initialize the window state because that's a requirement of the window. And then just a sequence of all the possible things, the values that I need for my editor function. This is why it's the state. And just each image is wrapped in an option so that if none, it doesn't render anything. If some, it renders the image. In order to get the editor window to actually show up in your game, you need to add the editor window to your main application. This is done by when you include the Bevy Editor Please uh, preload, it comes with an extended trait for Bevy's application that allows you to specify adding an editor window. That should be basically everything you need to know in order to set up a basic editor window that has world access, so you should be able to achieve all the functionality that you would for any Bevy system, but with a user interface to allow you to click and interact with buttons and whatnot. There is also a whole bunch of other helper methods attached to the UI that you are passed when you have your editor window. All these extra functionality allows you to make some pretty robust UIs already in Bevy, but hopefully when the Bevy editor comes out in 0.11, we will have all these functionalities without needing to use an external plugin. I hope to do more videos in the future showing off how to use some of Bevy's community plugins. So don't forget to like and subscribe so that you don't miss those videos in the future.